I thank you for the way that you walk with each one of us and the way you guide us. Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross and that you would speak through me this morning. And it's all your name. Amen. This is kind of cool. Uh, I think I was talking to my wife. Uh, man, 2006 or 5 was the first time that I ever gave a sermon. And it was right here. I didn't really know uh, which side I'd be on. I didn't know if I'd have a mic or whatever. But I, it's kind of cool. This was the first place that I had an opportunity to share uh, what God was doing in my life. And I'm excited that I get to do that this morning uh, with you guys. Uh, and since I'm from the South, I will say y'all. Uh, don't, don't hang up on y'all or bless your heart or a couple of those things. Uh, if Steve was here, uh, if you don't know, he's my twin, he would be sitting back there making fun of me or flagging me down saying, don't say y'all, uh, you're from, you're not from the South. Uh, but here I am and I get to be with you. And so if I'm going to be, I want to be vulnerable with y'all this morning. I want to share with you something that happened when I was in middle school and high school and it happened here. Um, and it's true, I had a drug problem. I really struggled with being drugged in church. My parents always drove me here. If it was VBS, if it was Sunday, you caught it, there it is. It wasn't like a real drug problem, it was like I was drugged. Yes, uh, my parents drove me here. They brought me to church, they made me come. Uh, my father and I had a lot of arguments and fights early in the morning about coming to church. And I'm so thankful that my dad and my mom, they drugged me to come here. Because what was cool is that you guys, as this congregation shaped my life. And I didn't know that I was being shaped. I didn't know that I was going to be able to recall Bible verses that I learned in Sunday school or remember the kind acts of people in my life. But God was doing something. And it's so cool when Pastor Joey asked me to come because I had, I had an opportunity to reflect and to think about all those, those cool things. When we look at parables in the Bible, we start looking through any parable where Jesus is teaching the disciples, they're also being drugged around, right? Jesus is bringing them around. He's sharing with them these parables that don't necessarily make sense to them in the moment. Kind of like when I was here and uh, Beth would tell me to be kind, and I'm like, I don't want to be kind, I want to be, be me. Uh, but Jesus was shaping them, and he shares this parable, this parable of the vine. And in verse 1 it says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. This I am statement is important. Because this I am statement is not found in any of the other Gospels. It's only found in John. Um, but through John we hear a lot of I am statements. In chapter 6 it says, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. In chapter 8 it says, I am the light of the world. Chapter 10, it says, I am the sheep's door. I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. And in John 14, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is saying these I am statements so that we can understand about his character. We can understand who he is. Uh, because in these teachings, the disciples didn't know that he was the Messiah. Now, Jesus said it to them all the time. They should have understood these things. But they didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah until the resurrection. And so we see these I am statements to prove a point, to show who Jesus is. And then, so what's going on in chapter 15 is it's called the, the Jesus Farewell Discord. This is where Jesus, everything that Jesus is doing is leading up uh, to the crucifixion the crucifixion uh, to the cross. And so as this is happening, they would have been walking through vineyards, uh, and Jesus would have said, I am the true one. Um, I picture the disciples being confused, being like, what are you talking about? Uh, which might not have been the case. And in, Ze in the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, we see this really cool story about a farmer or a master that gets a piece of land and he, and he buys all this expensive vines so that he can make wine. And by the end of the story, it doesn't work, and he gets angry, and he tears all the vines out. And so Jesus saying, I am the true vine, is pointing back to the Old Testament. So they would have understood that this vine meant something. And so if, if 
you want to follow along in scripture, I'm just going to call a couple verses out and just share a couple different ideas. Um, but the first thing we see in this section is we see the words abide in me or remain in me. And so what does that mean? Um, what that means is that we are connected to Christ, that we have accepted or that we are acting in accordance to Jesus' life. And I, and I ultimately think that this means that we are following Jesus. And so that is what it means to be connected to the body, is that we are following in who Jesus is. One of the first things I want to say though is that I think it's important for us before we move through this text is that when we are cutting off vines in this section, there's two, two moments where we're talking about pruning. This, doesn't, this isn't talking about hell. This isn't talking about throwing people in hell. Because if you are connected to the church, if you are connected to Jesus, and you have accepted him, you are connected to the Father. And I think that's a good place for us to start. But, in verses 2 and 6, we get to see two ideas of pruning, of cutting. Um, and then I think there's two different ideas. There's two different Greek words. And so the first example of pruning, um, I think, is where we are cutting pieces off of who we are. Maybe sinful things in our lives that we, we need to remove. We need to be changed. Um, if you had a, the pleasure of teaching me in Sunday school or interacting with me when I was in high school or middle school, uh, I had some character flaws. Uh, I was probably one of the more sarcastic students. I was absolutely a pessimist. Um, and I was definitely so. And so these are three things in my life that needed to be removed. Maybe you'd struggle with greed, or anger, or lust, something else. These were the three that, as I think of back when I was in high school, that I struggled with. And Jesus needed to remove it. And he had, it was not for anything but to be best for me. Uh, and this was, I, I think of the story often, I was in Columbus, Indiana, with the Schweers and my parents and my brother. And we went to some sports bar to have dinner. And like my, I did not want to go there. I'm sure Steve got to pick where to eat. I didn't like that. And so I decided, like most times when I was in high school, I wanted to make everyone's life around me miserable. That's not true. I didn't think that way, but that's what happened. Is I would just be hateful. I would be mean. The french fries weren't good enough. Uh, and I remember Beth saying to me, and I, and I don't remember the whole conversation, but I remember her saying, why aren't you just a hateful one? Uh, and probably followed up with something like, man, it would be nice if you were kind, or it would be nice if you would say something positive. Uh, and I remember that moment, because in moments when I start becoming a pessimist or stubborn, uh, I call that, and that was a pruning moment, and I love that it was from someone in this church, this congregation, that, was, that pruned me. Now, I think we also get this second pruning, this second idea of cutting back. Uh, and this is where I think God does stuff in our lives that changes us, but it gives us an opportunity to grow the kingdom. Because uh, there are things in our lives that change. There are bad things that happen in our life that we don't know why they happen. Uh, and I did want to share a story about a, about a pastor that I get to work with down in Huntsville. His name is Pastor Bill. He's this tall. Uh, he has been a pastor his entire life. Uh, and he always talks about this, that he's an alcoholic. And when I hear that, and the way he talks about it is that he was like an alcoholic last week. But he was really an alcoholic 20 years ago. But when he fell into alcoholism, he had a family, he had three kids, he had a very uh, successful church that he was leading, um, and that was all stripped away from him. Just taken away because he was an alcoholic. It took him 15 years before he got back into the pulpit, before he was serving a church, but whenever he is talking about this, a lot of times I go, man, you were a pastor, and you messed up. But this is what's so cool about Pastor Bill, is that in our church, we have five different AA meetings that now meet because of Pastor Bill, and we have 20 to 40 alcoholics that show up to our church five times a week to talk about their struggles, to talk about moving and changing the kingdom of God. And I'm so thankful for that. And so we all have these moments in our lives that hurt, that are painful, but they're pruning, and, they, and we can then use those for the kingdom of God. 
Something else that is talk, talked about in this passage of Scripture is fruit. Is that we're supposed to produce fruit. And the easiest way for me to explain this fruit is by Galatians 5, 23, 22 through 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are fruits of the Spirit. Now, Jesus never really taught about the fruits of the Spirit. This was Paul in Galatians writing it. Uh, but we uh, get this gift of the fruits of the Spirit. And I believe that when we are abiding, when we are remain, remaining in Christ, that we will display the fruits of the Spirit. That these will be coming in our lives. That we will share them with one another. We'll be more patient. We will love one another more. Um, and so this is the fruit that I believe it's talking about. I think it also is talking about the moment that I shared with Ben and I is that we are we are walking with other people. We were we are teaching them how to be more like Jesus, um, and so that is fruit. And so before we leave this one, I want you to think of two questions, just personally. Uh, you can think about it right now. You can think about it after lunch. Uh, but are you abiding or remaining in Christ? That's question one. And question two is. Is there fruit in your life? Is there love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, self-control? Uh, are you caring for someone else? Are you walking with them? And so, I want to get to the commandment that we'll see later in this passage in verse, verse 12. But before we get there, there are two more verses I just want to pull out I really like is. John 15, verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That's not a cheat code. This isn't like, hey, if I abide in Christ and whatever I pray, God will give it to me. I don't think that's necessarily what is being said here. What I think is being said is that as we abide and remain in Christ, our prayers will become like God's prayers. That once we know more about Jesus, know more about God, our God, our prayers will be like His, for example. Uh, Haley and I have been married for two and almost three years, and I believe that God would agree with a prayer of, I pray to have a strong relationship with my wife. I pray to have a good marriage. That would be true. I think God would, would agree with that prayer. Now, if I was praying, uh, God, please give me more money so that I can have a bigger house that I could have a better car, because then my marriage would be better. Like, those are the things that will make my marriage better. I think that we're missing the mark with what our prayers and our prayer life should look like. And so I think as we remain in Christ, our prayers will become like God's prayers. And then 1511 says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I want this joy. Like, I want to understand what this joy is that Jesus is offering. And this joy is different than happiness. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is momentary. Uh, it can change on the drop of a hat, but joy doesn't change. This is from God. This is something that when we have joy, uh, it changes our outlook on life. It makes us happy or it makes us content with the situations that are going around us. So then in closing, after we hear all these things, after we hear this parable from Jesus of remaining and abiding in him, we get a command. Because it would it's, it'd be really sad if we came to church every Sunday and we talked about these really cool ideas or, man, Jesus loves us, but we never put it into action. And I think what Jesus is doing here is he's giving us this parable, this idea, these thoughts, and then he tells us to put it in action. First of all, says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. This is so cool to me because God has chosen us. He loves us and he wants to be our friend. Oftentimes I think of God as a dictator, which is just not true. 
He is our friend, and he loves us. And he is telling us that if, if we are moved from his love to love others, to share that love, and that is our command. And so in closing, I have three statements, three questions uh, that I want to just kind of throw out there, reflect on them, think about it, let them move you. Uh, the first one is, is, do you trust God? Is he at the center of your life? Do you believe that he died for your sins? I think this is the first important question that we should ask ourselves daily. Are we letting Jesus into our life? And then our second question as we start growing as believers is, are we abiding, are we remaining in Christ? Are we walking in that relationship? And I have five marks on your life that I want to share that if you are abiding, that you will, you will see these marks in your life. Uh, and not always, but sometimes. The first one is you would be producing fruit. Fruit that will last, either through the fruits of the Spirit or you'll be walking with people. I would say I am a fruit of this church. This church poured into me and now I get to pour into others. Number two, pruning is happening in your life. You are being challenged. You are being uncomfortable. Um, and God is walking you through that. That would be the second mark. The third is that your prayers will be being answered. Your prayers will be answered if you are abiding in Christ. Number three, and this is a tough one even when I say it this morning, it's more me talking to my heart, is that if, if you are remaining in God's love, you will have a genuine love for God's people. I'm a student minister, and we all have that one kid in the youth group that is so hard to love, that is so always doing the wrong things, that is always making it difficult. But we are called to love them. And I always like to say it to my students that sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. You just love people. And then the last mark is that if you are abiding in Jesus, you will experience joy. There will be joy in your life. And then my last question for you to consider or think is how much fruit is enough fruit? Because I think we live in a society and a world where we want a lot. We want a ton of fruit. But that was a trick question because it's not about the fruit. It's about Jesus. It's about the true vine. And that is how we know that we are remaining in Him. Is if we are walking in a relationship with the Father. Let's pray. God, I lift up this congregation to you, Lord. This church. I thank you for the works that they have done for the for the last hundred years in Sunday school, for the church that has been around for long, much longer than that. Lord, I pray that you would continue to pour your spirit out on this church. That they would continue to love and to seek after your love. That they would know how much you care for them. Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to share what we put on my heart. God, I pray that as we move to our next piece of worship, that you would be present, that you would be here with us. And it's all in your name. Amen. Let us sing together.